You're listening to What's Work Got to Do With It, your go-to resource on all things workplace safety, health, and well-being. This podcast series invites you into the conversation as we discuss how our workplace conditions like work hours, occupational stress, job safety, and other issues affect our lives at work and at home. We go into the science behind it all and talk about what we can do to reduce work-related risk and promote well-being. On today's episode of What's Work Got to Do With It, we wanted to highlight a talk from our 2020 fall symposium where we covered the topic of worker health, work as a social determinant of health. We're gonna hear from speaker Reina Lopez. She's the executive director of Bakun, and we're gonna cover the topic of farm workers experience during COVID-19. Specifically, this symposium covered the social determinants of health. The, you know, the official definition of social determinants of health by the World Health Organization, they say the social determinants of health, or SDH, are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So in all work and its associated conditions is a key piece of social determinants of health, and work is also impacted by other social determinants of health, such as education, access to health care, economic status of one's family. And work as a social determinant of health has received attention in the public health field and specifically in the areas of occupational health. Reina Lopez is a leader and proud daughter of immigrants from Mexico who came to Oregon in the late 80s following the migration of farm work in the Marion County area. She is currently the executive director of PACUN, which was started by farm workers and is now Oregon's longest standing Latinx led organization. Reina grew up in Salem, Oregon and graduated from Willamette University with her BA in political science and sociology. For over a decade, she has been a fierce leader and advocate for the Latinx community in Oregon, receiving the Immigrant Award from the American Association of Immigration Lawyers of Oregon and Willamette University's Young Alumni of the Year Award for her work in social justice causes, campaigns, movement, and coalition building. I'm Reina Lopez. I'm the executive director of Begun. We represent farm workers and Latinx working families in Oregon. Um, I myself, as you heard, I'm a daughter of immigrants that came to Oregon following the migration of, of farm work north. And my story really, I, I like to say that it starts with them coming here, looking for a better life. As a, as a kid myself, I was out in the fields too, picking blueberries, marionberries, cherries, even worms at one point. Um, and as you probably have imagined and you must have heard already, uh, the pandemic and the recent wildfires have only magnified the gaps in our society. Farm workers are essential and they are being called essential right now, but yet treated disposable. And what I like to remind people is that farm workers were essential before the pandemic and they will be essential after the pandemic. Time and time again, um, I, we're hearing testimonies from agricultural workers who frankly just feel forgotten. And that's because over 50% of our workplace outbreaks here in Oregon today are affecting the essential food supply chain. That's because 40% of COVID-19 cases, almost 40% right now, that's been fluctuating a little bit, um, have hit the Latinx community the hardest, despite only being 13% of the population. And it's because people are getting fired. They're getting uh, laid off without any sick pay. And um, what they really need is support when they need to quarantine during this time. And it's because many farm workers are undocumented and uh, and without being acknowledged as the backbone of our essential workforce. Uh, this means that many of them are being left out of unemployment insurance when, when the jobs are, aren't um, calling them back and there's no safety net. And it's because agricultural workers are being asked to do the most dangerous uh, jobs without that being reflected in their pay. And because today, uh, workers are being assigned to labor housing with dozens of other workers, sometimes sometimes hundreds, and that makes social distancing uh, impossible and conditions more deadly. And 
many I've been getting many reporters calling, many people calling, just wondering why is it that Latinx folks are being hit so hard? Well, I'm I'm here to tell you why. And um, I've had to repeat it many times, but hopefully it'll it'll stick. <laughs> um, so we're really as Pekun, we're really trying to 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 own the essential essential worker label and really use this moment as a catalyst for change. I think Pekun's fundamental goal has always been to support our farm workers and and go up against the exploitation of our bodies of our of our workers in, in Oregon and and um, we really want to make sure that this message is is loud and clear. So um, a little bit about Pecun and Pecun's mission. It stands for the Pineros y Campesinos Unidos del Noroeste. Uh, everyone's going to be tested on that after this. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it uh, stands for the farm workers and the tree planters of the Northwest. And our mission is really to empower farm workers and Latinx working families in Oregon. We do this through community building, uh, through increasing representation of Latinx folks in elections and in all kinds of spaces. Pekun was founded in 1985. We're one of the oldest Latinx-led um, organizations in the state, and originally the goal was was to empower farm workers to understand and take action against systematic exploitation and all of its effects. And this is actually um, these are some old photos that are at Pekun today. They're actually in one of, on the one of the walls in our conference room. Uh, that was taken in 1988. And just around the time we were getting started and um, visiting the camps here in Oregon. And, you know, they've gotten better. I will say that <laughs> um, we're not seeing a lot of these little shacks anymore, but conditions are still not where they should be. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, uh, they're definitely not where we want them to be. And we're not satisfied with what is what's happening in this moment. Our theory of change, um, just to share with you a little bit of how we do our work, is very much centered in relationships. And the that's really to be in relationship with each other and our local communities, but also a global community. Because we know not only that our, as immigrant communities, immigrant workers, our families are in different places in the world, but also with um, issues that are coming up. Uh, that are so pertinent in our communities today, like climate change and um, and immigration reform. All of that is something that we need to look at also on a global scale. Just looking at it locally isn't enough, right? And so we do that through several ways. One of them is community outreach and base building. So we have a program that goes all year round um, that focuses on worker empowerment. And we have a set of, of work, uh, outreach workers. They themselves were agricultural workers at one point in their lives. Um, some of them speak indigenous languages that are spoken by many of the farm workers that are out there picking our fruits and vegetables and, and tending to our uh, Christmas trees before we get them during the holiday, um, making sure that we can communicate with them. And we build community spaces that are deeply rooted in our cultural connections, especially in our indigenous cultures. A big percentage of Pekun's membership um, is actually identifies as indigenous from Mexico and Central America. Um, and I myself, my family is uh, Tarasco, which is a, a tribe down in Michoacan, which is a, a, a lot of folks that, that are actually in Oregon today come from these little villages in Michoacan. Uh, the other part of this is grassroots policy advocacy and base building based on strong coalitions. So we advocate for progress. We advocate for pro-farm worker, pro-working family, pro-immigrant policies at the state and national levels. And we can't do this without strong coalitions, without finding common ground with people and without showing up for each other. So we have really like one really great example I like to give is, is our relationship with the LGBTQIA movement. And um Many of our elders from Pekun have very vivid memories of ha bringing farm workers to march with the LGBTQIA movement and um, and fighting against really nasty po attacks that were happening in the 90s. And to us, you know, a fight for equality, a fight for equity. It's not just about farm workers, right? It's important that we do that for everybody. 
And of course, uh, what we're known for is organizing. And what I mean by organizing is really people-powered movements uh, where we organize, frankly, around anything that we can get our hands on. What I like to joke around about about Bakun is that we're really whatever you need us to be in that moment, what the community needs us to be in that moment. And I'll be speaking today about what that's meant throughout COVID and what that's meant with the wildfires that affected us these last few months. Um, but we try to organize with every tool available to us. And so um, Pekun, um, we have our farm worker union, we have um, a charitable organization, a C4, and a PAC that does a lot more of the political um, work that keeps people accountable to our communities. And um, that pretty much embodies our theory of change. In terms of the impacts of COVID-19, I'm sure everybody's read the articles. I'm sure you've you've seen a lot of the of the you've heard you've seen and heard some of the hype even in the public health and and maybe even some of you who are seeing face to face clients that are needing your support. That the data shows that um, in Oregon, um, our Latinx communities are being hit the hardest. And again, I shared this when I introduced myself, but just the fact that even though we're only 13% of the population, our cases are almost at 40%. And that's because a lot of our Latinos really work in essential jobs. They work in the fields, they work in restaurants, construction, many service-based jobs that are, it's really important that in order for us to have financial stability, when these workers are hit hard to, due to the pandemic, that means devastating effects for our communities. That's because of several things that are really uh, system, they're systematic, they're social issues, they're reasons that we can't actually um, do certain things, right? Like just stay at home and, and work when um, shelter in place is being called to, to order, right? So of that is due to low wages, our immigration status, which means that we have a lot of barriers to accessing services that most people take for granted. And this fear of retaliation is, is very real amongst the essential uh, workforce especially because there are already oppressive conditions in the workplace. That means that many workers have little to no power around what happens to them in terms of their situation at work. And uh, other observations that we just had throughout time is just that a lot of systems that were in place failed failed us or just were never created to serve us, right? So um, in March, when we all heard that we had to shelter in place, a lot of the communication from our Oregon Health Authority or the um, or state governments, that was mostly in English. And the support came, the information came eventually, but um, it, was, it was a few months after that all had happened and a lot of the damage had been done. And then um, in terms of just the picture I want to point to here is uh, the the perfect storm that happened, you know, not just being hit like uh, like Dr. Cueva said earlier, you know, the first time, the second time. But now, you know, even the third time with these wildfires affecting our communities, whole communities that got burnt down, farm worker communities down in in Phoenix, Oregon, or, you know, for example, um, just folks that had to keep showing up to work despite what the levels of evacuations were at that moment. And a lot of these things were, were also caught in the media. I think the outbreaks, um, here are some outbreaks that I really wanted to make sure to highlight during this presentation. And it's kind of walking you through a series of some of the, the outbreaks that I think really can embody the problems that are coming up in our communities as well. So here's one from April, actually, and this was a severe coronavirus outbreak that happened at a, a pretty known meat packing plant, an outbreak that claimed the life of 60-year-old uh, Juan Guadalupe Oliveira Mendoza, who actually went home um, in March and died Monday after uh, the Monday after. Um, and he was on, at a hospital um, for about a week on a ventilator. 
And this is actually a similar stories that were happening here in Oregon that really sparked Bikun to take action. Um, we were getting calls from community members saying that their elders were passing away. And a lot of these elders were still working in the fields, still working in the plants. And we had to take action right away to figure out how to get these folks support because a lot of them were also undocumented and were not able to um, benefit from any of the relief that was starting to get pushed to communities during that time. Then this is another one that was has been pretty infamous in Oregon, and we've gotten a lot of calls about this one as well at our farm worker center. Um, Townsend Farm owner here talks about a cluster of coronavirus cases that, that happened um, at their housing, in their camps. And unfortunately, we were hearing that a couple dozens over hundreds of workers were getting affected by by Townsend. We had talked to a few of the workers at that camp, at that camp that um, were that opened up specifically and said that protocols were not being followed, and that even when there was a call to the agencies or complaints that were being made, that was not being followed up with. And you know, I often wonder if some of this stuff could have been preventable, maybe not, but at the very least, in terms of cases, I think that there was some some things that could have been done to mitigate. This one's a little more recent. Um, there was the major virus outbreak that hit Pacific Seafood. And the seafood processor um, had been actually using a private lab to conduct testing of 160 workers. And after 77 of those workers tested positive, the company chose to test 140 others. And um, we saw some a pretty massive outbreak at, or at the end of September. And even talking to some of the workers, they had opened up that they were staying at a um, at an employer provided hotel hotels and motels and that protocols were just not being followed um, either in in at those hotels and motels. So, you know, after looking at a couple of things that could signal to us if Oregon OSHA was actually looking um, to do ex inspections in those um, in those facilities or even at the hotels, we saw that not a lot of that had happened. And, you know, unfortunately, when we tried to ask uh, OSHA why there wasn't an inspection done at the motel and hotel they were telling us well it was just out of their their purview that's not that hotels and motels are not places that it's their job to inspect so you know kind of highlighting here also the need to have systematic change how do we make it something that OSHA has to look at how do we make sure that if it's a place that an employer is going to be um, putting their their h2a workers or um, migrant workers that it's being prioritized by our agencies and that we're making sure that we're setting people up to succeed. And then of course, uh, the New York Times really uh, pay, was paying attention, honestly. they We actually had um, a New York Times um, reporter ask us about what was happening in Woodburn um, around this time. This was a little bit earlier in the pandemic too, but um, they were asking, what's going on? Why is Oregon and specifically Marion County seeing such high rates? And uh, um, they did do um, a whole article about the infection rate of Hispanics in, in our state specifically and um, and what that meant in terms of prompting more testing and, and the state to take emergency measures. But Really, I mean, this is having devastating effects on our Latinx communities. Just in Oregon, it's important to note that um, that there's about 87,000 farm workers in Oregon. And again, this is the backbone of the, the workforce. It's Im an immigrant workforce, seasonal and migrant. Um, about 40 percent of of our workforce speaks solely indigenous languages. Many of those include Zapoteco, Triqui, Mixteco Bajo, Mam, and Chuch. And the numbers of workers that lack authorization, it's always really, it's a really rough estimate, but it's between 50 and 70%. So, you know, just considering these numbers, it's important to know that even when we have that information in Spanish, right, even when we have these programs available, um, it's it's always additional, we always need additional work, because even with the indigenous languages, we need to make sure that people who speak those languages, who can, who have the trust of the community can actually go out and, and share that information. 
And then let's talk about the impacts of the wildfires on our communities. Um, that was a really devastating week, I'll be honest with you. There is a video that I wanted to show you all um, today because I think that um, it just shows the effect that it had on Oregon and specifically the effect that it had on our farm workers. How is Pecun supporting farm workers during COVID-19 and the wildfires? We, you saw a little bit about what our operation ended up doing. I mean, a lot of it had to literally was rapid response work. We had to just get out there and we had to go, go out there and deliver things and make sure that we had a good understanding of what people needed us to do for them at that time. So um, there were several programs that got set up very quickly to serve um, the communities that were left out of any help and were left out of the communications that should have been uh, available to everybody. Um, so one of those is actually the Oregon Worker Relief Fund, um, which actually provides financial support directly to Oregonians who have lost their jobs due to the pandemic or they lost wages due to the pandemic and were not eligible for unemployment and federal stimulus supports. So I'm happy to report that uh, as of today, we have been able to to distribute over $30 million out of that, thousands and thousands of undocumented workers in Oregon and make sure that they're not going into uh, financial destruction because of not having some kind of relief. And also, we just got another $25 million allocation to be able to, to continue to support undocumented workers in this time. And then we also started the Oregon Worker Quarantine Fund, which is a 1,290 financial support to farm workers who have to self-quarantine for 14 days after being exposed to COVID-19. And this is really, really important because most agricultural workers do not have paid sick leave, right? So two weeks, three weeks taking off of work, that's just not possible. And so if you do not have the possibility to take that time, you're not going to do it. You're always going to prioritize making sure that you can put food on the table, not just for the country and the state, but for your own family. And it means that if you're sick, you might show you might risk going to work. And then there you go. There, there's an outbreak that happens because you were not able to just take the time that you needed. There's also another fund that we started called the Pacoon Emergency Fund. And that's specifically for folks that were affected by wildfires. And it was also it kind of became this flexible account. We um, also made sure to um, add additional support for people who needed to quarantine, but um, but mainly for folks now that are affected by Oregon wildfires. Not only getting financial support to be able to um, take care of their basic needs, but also hygiene products, PPE, and uh, KN95 masks for the pandemic, but also N95 masks and goggles during the the um, the wildfires that happened in September as well, and making sure that people have everything they need. Because we were hearing stories about employers charging people up to seven dollars, seven ten dollars a day to have them provide PPE for them. And we just thought that that was pretty unacceptable and that if we could make sure that people got these items for free, then that would be one of the best ways that we could, and one of the most simple ways we can not only mitigate COVID, but also help people protect themselves when they're working, especially if they have to work during the wildfires. Uh, in terms of what we're doing to continue to support, it's really important that we go beyond the direct service, right? It's more than just giving people a cash financial aid uh, when they're having issues. It's more than just giving people hygiene products and PPE. We actually have to change systems because these are all systematic issues that are affecting our communities. If people were, had citizenship today or if people had a pathway to legalization today, they would be eligible for unemployment insurance, right? Um, so these are struggles that we've been in for many, many years. And the last time we had an actual immigration reform was in 1986 when my family uh, was able to benefit from that. And it changed the trajectory of our lives. But um, number one, national immigration reform must happen in order for us to address one of the most massive uh, 
systematic issues that we have um, that has literally created a second class of people in our economy and our workplace. Also, we have been trying to pass the Farm Workforce Modernization Act on the national level. It actually passed last year in the in the House. Uh, we didn't see it move at all in the Senate, but it would have it would have allowed a pathway to legalization for agricultural workers um, that have been in the United States doing this work for many years. And also the Farm Labor Protections Act at the national level that actually was part of it got put into the HEROES Act, but also had robust protocols around COVID-19 for agricultural workers and workers just generally in the essential food supply chain. And locally, we are working on a whole uh, a whole workers agenda at the Capitol to make sure that systematic change happens. We have put in a placeholder bill as well for farm worker overtime. Um, maybe some of you may or may not know, but farm workers are not entitled to overtime pay in Oregon and neither are domestic workers. So that's something that we want to fix systematically. And we think that especially in these times of COVID when we're, we are working overtime to make sure people have food on their table, that they also get paid that, that overtime. Um, and a, we're also doing a lot of intersectional work, um, especially around child care issues, uh, elections, and just continuing to do community care. So I'm really excited about what's to come, climate, climate justice issues as well. And I will you know, pause here and say thank you to everyone. And also, if you want to get involved and sign up, you can visit www.pacoon.org. And I will take your questions. Thanks so much for tuning in today to help us recap and revisit a talk from Reina Lopez from Pacoon um, from our fall symposium. Um, on that note, we will be hosting a 2021 spring symposia. Everything will be virtual. That's on Friday, May 21st. We're covering the topic of adapting to climate change for worker safety, health, and well-being. If you're interested in learning more information, you can visit our website at www.ohsu.edu slash occhealthsci, and that's O-C-C-H-E-A-L-T-H-S-C-I. You can visit our outreach and education tab and then scroll down to training and symposia. And for some reason, if you do miss and aren't able to join us for our upcoming symposium, we do offer the recordings available post-event at no cost. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of What's Work Got to Do With It? We'll catch you next time. This podcast is a production of the Oregon Institute of Occupation Health Sciences and Oregon Healthy Workforce Center, and is produced by myself, Helen Shuckers, Nicole Guilfoy, Sam Greenspan, and Anjali Ramesh Babu. Subscribe to the Oregon in the Workplace blog or follow us on our social media channels on either Facebook or Twitter to stay updated on current research, resources, news, and community events.